morning, Journey Church. How we doing? Good, good. Um, I heard my name, so a few of you know me. Uh, some of you may not know me. Uh, and you may be wondering who's the black guy with the white shoes. That's, uh, <laughs> his name is Larry. I broke the ice, so you didn't have to. Um, my name is Larry Davis. I oversee our student ministry here at the Journey Church. And uh, I have the opportunity to, yeah, yeah. We have, yeah. Well, while you're clapping, let me just keep you there for a second. Uh, we, uh, that's kind of the primary lane that I, that I run in, and I, I love it. I love every ounce of me. We, I love, I love student ministry. It's so valuable. Um, just a couple of reasons why I, I love this so much is that we, so we don't exist to replace this. We don't exist to replace what we call a big church, uh, but we exist to, to just put a magnifying glass on this next generation because they go through some very severe things. What they're doing over uh, the course of in, in middle school and high school is so crucial. They're making crucial decisions that will begin to shape the, the rest of their lives. So, um, and statistically, uh, a mass majority of all believers come to Christ before the age of 18, but I'm also haunted by very, very uh, high statistic of 66% of students walk away from the church within two years after graduation. So we are very passionate about discipling students to build the entirety of their lives on the firm foundation, to develop leaders, to pour into those students, and most importantly, to equip and walk closely to the parents as you are the primary disciple maker for your kids and we want to do everything that we can to make sure that our students are living a life that puts Jesus on full display. So with all that being said, if you have a student that is in middle school or high school or um, maybe one that's already been attending but I haven't had the chance to meet you, I will be after, I will be out in the lobby after service and I would love to connect with you and just to kind of point you to uh, the direction that we're headed as a student ministry and I would love to just meet you and get to know you and figure out ways that I can partner with you in the near future. Amen? Amen. Well, uh, for time to time I get to, to preach, I'm entrusted to do this uh, this weekend. So thank you so much for Pastor Eric and the elders for allowing me to, to bring the word this morning. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Psalm 23. We'll get there in just a moment. Psalm 23. So while we're turning there, there are some very popular things in, during our lifetime that we uh, just kind of undervalue. There's a lot of things that are very popular, very popular things in our lives that are highly undervalued. And there are some several things uh, that has been right in front of us that we've, com that we've missed completely altogether, right? And some of you may, your, your wheels may be turning already. You may have a few ideas of what kind of, um, what kind of fits into that bucket. So I'll just kind of list out a few here. Here's the first one. Um, if you write with a pen... A lot of those pins have a little hole on the top, and this hole is also in Lego heads, just in case your kid swallows it and it prevents them from choking. Did you know that? Never knew. Don't try that, but it's true. That's true. It should bring you a little comfort. Here's another one. The lids on your takeaway cups, and when you go, you, know, you sit down in the restaurant and say, hey, I would like the Dr. Pepper to go, they give you a little takeaway cup. Those lids can also serve as a coaster. Blew my mind. Never knew. Here's another one. The margins on your notebook paper, maybe you're taking notes and you see the margins, like this little red line and maybe like this light blue thin line on the right side. Those margins aren't just to kind of contain your, your writing, but they, they exist to protect the, and preserve the writings back in the days, right? Because there's a lot of rodents, a lot of critters around and they would chew on the sides. Did you know that? Never knew. Never knew. And here's my favorite. Here's my favorite. And it will, <laughs> this will be the last one. You ever want to have the doors in the bathroom stalls, they don't come all the way to the bottom? You ever notice that? It's kind of intimidating, right? So the first reason, of course, is to know that it's occupied, which, by the way, when you're in middle school, this is the most traumatizing experience <laughs> ever, right? You're like, please don't, I don't want anybody to see my shoes, right? They walk by, you kind of lift your legs up, right? You don't want anybody to know. So that's the first reason, so that people would know that it's occupied. But here's the second reason, and I lost my lid when I, when I heard this. Second reason is it serves as an emergency exit and an emergency entrance. Both of those scenarios I never want to be in, right? If I have to emergency exit, what is happening? <laughs> and if someone has to crawl under and get me, what is happening, right? Like, I never want to be in those two scenarios. But I think very quickly, very quickly, we, we've noticed that because we haven't seen 
uh, these things in its full capacity. We, we've missed great opportunities to use them in its full capacity. But here's my fear, and here's reality. We do the same thing with God's word. We do the same thing with God's word. There, there are a few passages of scripture that we know that anyone, a bunch of people know who never even stepped a foot in the church ever. They know these passages, but they have no idea what they truly mean. They, they've missed the value of those. Just, just to name a few, John 3.16, right? You can go to any random person and they can quote you this verse. They can quote you this, but, but the danger is if we don't truly understand the implications of what this means for us, if we don't truly understand what Jesus' love actually looked like, we wouldn't miss the cross completely. So evangelists will go in and say, hey, Jesus loves you. Amen. See you later. Completely missed it. Here's another one. Judge not, lest you too be judged. Only God can judge me. A lot of us don't even know what that is in Scripture, right? But we know, we know that, right? And, and, and I would say we, we don't truly know the value of that. We don't truly understand what is being said there. It's not that we, we would disagree that God has the gavel, right? He's the ultimate one that, that judges. But what they're saying in that moment is say, hey, you can't critique my life. I want to continue to live how I want to live. But in reality, it would benefit them a lot if I was critiquing their life, right? Before they were standing before the one with the gavel in their hand. Again, they know the verse. They missed the implication. And that leads us to the last one, which is Psalm 23 that we'll dive in today. And here's my fear. Here's my fear. My fear is that Psalm 23 is, is extremely popular, right? We see it on t-shirts. Maybe you have it printed on your, on your wall or on your pillow. But do we truly understand what is being said here? Or, or is Psalm 23, does it serve the same purpose as a Starbucks drink in the morning? As a quick pick-me-up when I'm dragging or when I'm behind or when I'm, low, when I'm low? Or do we truly see the value of it? My prayer is that when we leave here this morning, that we will truly behold the value of this passage. And here's what I want us to hang on to today. In the midst of trying circumstances, God's people are to be content with the care and the comfort that he provides for them. In the midst of trying circumstances, God's people are to be content with the care and the comfort that he provides for them. So if you have your Bibles, please stand with me as we read Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So David understands the role of the shepherd very well, as he was himself. Charles Spurgeon makes a quote on Psalm 22, the psalm in the canon, placed strategically, I believe, right before Psalm 23. Uh, the psalm is also called the psalm of the cross. And here, here, here are his comments about this. He says, we must, by experience, know the value of the blood shedding and see the sword awaken against the shepherd before we shall be able to truly know the sweetness of the good shepherd's care. What he's saying is that we, we first see the psalm of, of this foretelling of Jesus' death and resurrection, and it is only because of Psalm 23 that, or Psalm 22 uh, of this reality that we can truly behold and embrace this. Here's what he's saying. He's saying until we behold the cross, we don't truly understand God's provision. If we don't have a good grip on his ultimate provision for his people, we don't understand what, his, uh, what it's truly like to be shepherded by him. So he's saying we have, to understand, we have to behold the cross before we understand of how valuable it is that he is our shepherd. And this is so important for us to understand. In Psalm 23, Psalm 23 is not a psalm promising a life free of opposition. It's not promising a life free of pain 
or difficulty, but coming to Christ doesn't mean that we always live in ease, never experiencing hunger, never experiencing thirst, never experiencing death. We know that's not true. It's just in the midst of those things, in the middle of those things, he's with us. That's where the care, that's where the comfort comes from. We'll start back with verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, now church, for, for a lot of us, this isn't even the highlight of the psalm. This isn't even the highlight of the song, but, but I would argue that it should be. We just tend to kind of blow past this part, and we, we, we just want to get to the good stuff, right? The part of him being with us in the valley and providing for us and batting away enemies. We'll get there, but, but if we don't understand this first line, if we don't understand this first line, we won't capture the full song. We won't capture everything that David is declaring right there, and that's exactly what he's making. David is making a declaration here. He says, Lord, you are my shepherd. Lord, you are my shepherd. Now, let me ask you this. Who can claim a shepherd but its flock? Who can claim a shepherd but its flock? So in this, David is saying, Lord, you are my shepherd. Therefore, I'm your sheep. I'm your sheep. And I want to spend some time just unpacking what that, what that means for us. We, we have to understand the implications of what it's like to truly be a sheep. We see this a lot in scripture, right? Jesus called, <laughs> refers to his people, his lost people, as sheep. Now, being called a sheep is not necessarily a compliment, right? We, we, don't, we don't just say, yes, of all the animals, sheep. Not really a compliment, right? Sheep are, they're not the brightest animal. They're not the brightest animal. Uh, they are defenseless. They're defenseless. They can't protect themselves. They don't have the best vision. They don't have a killer nature, yet in all of this, they're very submissive and very compliant. So I, so I want you to think about this. Have you ever seen sheep on Animal Planet and, and the commentator is saying, you know, man, the sheep are really dominating the wild. <laughs> Never. Never saw that. Why? Because sheep were some of the first animals to be domesticated. They were some of the first uh, species to be domesticated. Now, this is so significant now. Sheep are not wild animals. And what are they, Larry? Well, sheep are property. Sheep are property owned by the shepherd, the master. So church, let's tread very carefully. Let's tread very carefully when we say that we are his sheep. So, because to tag yourself as a sheep is to tag yourself as his property. Property. Meaning that our life is not our own. That following Jesus is a self-denying, Jesus-delighting way of living. We deny ourselves and we delight in, in the goodness and the mercies of Jesus Christ. It's a less of me, more of you lifestyle. It's a I must decrease and you must increase lifestyle. If he is our shepherd, then we are his sheep. We are his property. I want you to notice the language. He's my shepherd. It's a personal connection, isn't it? He's not just in the clouds playing crowd control, right? He's not just in the clouds just kind of, you know, just calling shots and making decisions. He's very much so in the details. He's in the details of our lives. And this is amazing. We have to behold this. We, we can all say that Trump is our president, that he's making decisions, that he's calling the shots. But he doesn't know us personally. He doesn't know us intimately. But we serve a God who's transcendent, that is above all. But he's also imminent, he's near, he's personal. There's no other king that compares to that. There's no other king that knows each and every one of you, each and every one of his people on a personal and intimate level, yet goes alone guiding and shepherding them for their good and his glory. It doesn't exist with any other God. That's what separates our God from any other God. And since God is his shepherd, since God is his shepherd, he says he does not want. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that he will give us everything that our little hearts desire. What it truly means is that he is everything our little hearts should desire. I shall not want. I shall not want. Here's what he's saying, meaning that outside the providence of God, outside the providence of God, David understands that he lacks nothing. He lacks nothing outside the providence of God, of God himself, that with God, all of his needs are met. With God, he is complete. God is his portion. That he's not missing out on anything God doesn't have for him. 
that God plus nothing equals everything. Everything he needs, everything he desires. So to say the Lord is my shepherd is to say I am his sheep. I am your property. I know that I'm weak. I know that I'm defenseless. I know I don't have the best vision. I know that I'm foolish. That's why I need you, God. That's what that really means. To say, God, you are my shepherd. My shepherd who would care and provide for me. Though being called sheep is not a compliment, to be called his sheep, oh boy, is the most beautiful and joyful gift ever. Verses 2 and 3. David continues to brag about the kindness and provision of our great shepherd. He says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So David explains why he does not want outside the provision of God, because it's God himself who not only saves him, but sanctifies him. It's God himself who not only saves him, but also sustains him. It's the God of the universe that's holding all things in place, but also holding David's life and our life in his hands as well. The great shepherd is doing the leading. The great shepherd is doing the restoring. Notice the language here. He makes me lie down in green pastures. What is that for us? What, is it, what does it mean to lie down in the green pastures? It's his word. It's his word, we, 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 which is always fresh. It's always nourishing for our souls. It fills us up and it sustains us. Charles Spurgeon says this. I'm just going to let you know. Anytime you hear me preach, you will hear a lot of Spurgeon. I'm a really big fan. But he says this. He says, there is no fear of biting the bare ground where the grass is long enough for the flock to lie down in it. There is no fear for biting the bare ground when the grass itself is so long that we can lie down in it. But there is great fear. There is great fear for lying in anything else because it is bare ground. Because it is only God's word that can nourish our souls. Philip Keller is a pastor and an author. He was also a shepherd for eight years. He made this comment on this passage and said, It's almost impossible for sheep to lie down unless certain requirements are met. It's almost impossible for sheep to lie down if certain requirements are, uh, unless certain requirements are met. Explain what these four things are. Here, here they are. Number one, because they are timid, sheep refuse to lie down if they are fear, if they if they are not free of fear. Sheep refuse to lie down unless they are free of fear. Here's the second one. Sheep will not lie down unless they are free from friction. With, with the other sheep that are in the flock. And I like to say, if there's any beef within the lambs, they don't want to lie down. <laughs> Let that one, do what you want with that one. <laughs> if tormented by flies or parasites, sheep will not lie down. We'll come back to this in a moment. And lastly, sheep will not lie down as long as they feel in need of finding food. So what does it mean? If he makes me lie down in green pastures, it means these requirements are met in full. It means that there's freedom from fear, there's freedom from friction, there's freedom from flies and torment, and there's freedom from famine. Before the sheep will lie down, and the great shepherd provides that freedom. He also says, lead me by still waters. What a significance of this. Still waters are peaceful. They're peaceful, they're, they're not turbulent or dangerous. They're not troublesome, and sheep will avoid running water like it's the plague. When they see it, they don't like it, and they will go the other way, because if they fall in it, because of their wool is so heavy, they, they would potentially drown. Now, this isn't saying that nothing bad will happen. This isn't saying that nothing bad will happen, but that God being our protector and provider has less to do with temporal comforts. He has less to do with that, but providing and guiding us toward what he wills for us, for our flourishing and for his glory. And when we trust when we trust in the Lord, we will find peace. Here's reality. Sheep, sheep cannot find the green pastures. Sheep cannot find the still waters. They can't find restoration, and they can't find the right path on their own. That's why they're in need of a great shepherd. The only guidance and provision of the great shepherd, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley in the shadow of death... I will fear no evil, for you are with me, and your rod and your staff, 
They comfort me. Notice that he says, even though, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. So I, please don't miss this. I want you to see this. He says, even though, even in the midst of walking in the shadow of death, this deep darkness that surrounds us doesn't remove evil, just the fear of it. It doesn't remove evil, just this response to evil. The, the believer walks through the valley, but they do not camp out there. Yes, we will walk through the valley, but we will not run through it aimlessly in a state of panic. But when we walk through the valley, it is in step with the shepherd. It is in step with the great shepherd. He doesn't say that there will be no evil, but that in the face of evil, fear has no place there. In the face of evil, he would not fear because God is with them. God is imminent. God is near. He knows our path before we take it. He walks it beside us, behind us, and he's already gone before us. That's why we don't fear. That's why we don't fear. And his comfort is fueled by his staff and his rod that keeps them on the right path. We're comforted by his saving grace and his sanctifying grace. A staff is like this cane-like tool that you, shepherds use to pull the sheep back onto the right path. And as you know, a rod is used to bat away enemies. But also, this is so interesting to me, when you see a rod in scripture, what does it refer to? Discipline. It refers to discipline. Why, why would David be comforted by discipline? Well, Scripture says God disciplines those he loves. And a part of this discipline, and a part of this discipline, it makes you more like him. It teaches you, hey, this is not the right path. Here is the right path. A part of this discipline is comforting because it's a process of becoming more like God himself. Verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. It says you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What does this mean? Well, in war, you don't have to time to just sit down and have a five-course meal, right? You don't, get to say, you don't get to go out into the field and say, hey, time out, break. I got to go smash the Slim Chickens meal real quick. We can come back and we can get back to the tanks and the missiles and stuff. Just leave Take five, please. We don't get to do that, right? We don't have the liberty to do that. So what does he mean by this? <clears throat> what does he mean by that, that you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies? Here's what he's saying. He's saying there's a stillness that comes with God's provision. There's, a still, there's an intentionality to say, Lord, I know they're knocking on my door. I know Satan is always lurking. But there's a still, I'm in your presence. Lord, there's a stillness here. Not only do I have time to feast, I'm sitting comfortably at a table. That's what it's like to truly trust and to truly lean in to the God, to, to the God that we serve. That the enemy has no power to hinder us from enjoying God. There's no power, no authority, no dominion. And he goes on to say, he anoints my head with oil, my cup overflows. This was a common practice during this time for cherished guests. They would perfume them and make sure their cup was always filled. So back to the imagery of sheep. Uh, they would get their head caught in something called briars. And they would go, uh, they, they would go crazy, right? Try, they would hurt themselves severely, trying to get themselves untangled. And going back to the flies that we mentioned earlier, that they had to be free from these flies until they sat down. Um, these flies would get into their ears, and they, they would lay these eggs. Um, and, and then those, those things would just kind of torment them, and they would go, literally go crazy. They would try to beat their heads to get the things out. Yeah, pretty gruesome. But that, that's the, so, so, the shepherd, so the shepherd would anoint this head, anoint their whole head with oil, and this oil performs this barrier of protection against the evil and, and that tries to destroy the sheep. Then there's peace. Then they will lie down. Then they will rest. So despite the enemies, despite the enemies, our cup overflows with the richness and the goodness of our God where there is freedom from friction. There's freedom from fear. There's freedom from famine, freedom from flies and torment. And freedom <clears throat> all together. I want to take, just take a step back and, and, and just press into the heart here. We're often in this situation, aren't we? We're in this situation a lot. We often feel like the sheep in this scenario. We get entangled with sin. We lean on our own strength to try to get ourselves out, and we just get deeper and deeper in sin. We end up hurting ourselves even more. 
annoying things begin to get into our head and it causes us to go crazy that something is wrong for us and we feel like we have to self-atone. There's peace. There's peace in the valley, the one that covers and protects us. The Lord anoints our head with oil and to overflow our cup with blessings. God is good and he's faithful all the time. Verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Notice he says all the days. All the days. Even through suffering. Even when I'm most sinful. All the days. Your goodness and your mercy shall follow me. You know why we question that? Here's why we question that. We question that. Because our circumstances become the scale of God's love. We measure God's love by the weight of our circumstances. We say, okay, I'm really, really deep into sin. He forgot about me. We have this idea that, that God will love you more when you get better. But you know a scripture that blows that out of proportion? Romans 5 says that, wow, you were still sinners. Jesus showed an unspeakable, the highest of love to ex be extended to the lowest of people while you're in opposition to him. So if he did it then, at your unmost lovable moment, he loves you with the highest love, why would he stop? Why would he stop? That's why we, that's why we, we, we question these things, that he would be with us all of our days because we measure his love and his care for us by the, by the measurement of our circumstances, by the weight of our circumstances. Let's not do this. Let's not measure the nearness and the intimacy of God by the weight of our circumstances. Let's remember that he's near and that will make us flee from sin and into his presence and the enemy will flee from us. We don't shout across the room for an empty God. We don't shout across the room at an absent God. The darkest of days and the brightest of days, the Lord is with us. He's with us through it all. Even as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we know that the end of that valley is where our citizenship is, is heaven, with him glorified forever. We're dependent. We're dependent on his goodness as it supplies our needs. And we're dependent on his mercy as it blots out our sins and never counts against his people. Those of us who are in Christ, we have a never-ending relationship with God. There's an undying guidance, an undying love and shepherding from the God that we serve. So here's what I want to kind of wrap up my time today, this morning. I want to give you a few handles to cling to. I know we talked about a lot from bathroom stalls to, to great shepherds. There's a few things for, for you to cling to. Number one, the sheep has no ownership of its life. Therefore, neither does God's people. The sheep, property. The sheep have no ownership of his life. Therefore, neither do God's people. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says that we were bought with a price and to glorify, God's, for, glorify God in our bodies. We don't get to call the shots. We don't get to make the decisions that will glorify ourselves. But everything that we do from our bodies, every sphere of our life is to point to the holiness and the goodness and the faithfulness of the God that we serve. The sheep has no ownership of his life, therefore neither is God's people. If that bothers you, that's good. I want it to. Because it's true. We are not our own. Sheep don't get to do what they want to do. When the, when the master calls, they come. When the master guides, they follow. When the master says stay, they lie down. Willingly, submissively, with all compliance. If, I want you to just begin to, to think about this and process this in your own life. If, if an alien popped in into your life and began to examine your life, but they know that every sphere of your life is being shaped by the gospel. But yeah, if, if, one, if someone pops in and they knock on your door, they say, hey, excuse me, ma'am, excuse me, sir. I have a warrant from God. I'm here to search every aspect of your life to make sure that it looks like Jesus. 
Some of you are like, I got life, and just go and take me, take me now. But that's how serious it is. That's how serious it is. He, every sphere of our life should point to the one that we're building it on. Sheep has no ownership of his life. Therefore, neither does his people. Number two, he doesn't send us through valleys. He leads us through valleys. He doesn't send us through valleys. He leads us through valleys. He's not just in the clouds just saying, hey, I taught you a lot. Let me see what you're really made of. Just go on this mission real quick. He doesn't open our backs and say, hey, here's some fresh new batteries. Let me wind you up real quick. Let me see how you do. We don't serve a deistic God. We serve a God who's in the details. We serve a God who's actively with us, even in the valley. He doesn't just send us through it. He leads us through it. Our confidence isn't merely that he plucks us out of the valley, but in the valley, we're reminded that he's there with us. It's teaching us how to trust him. It's teaching us how to depend on him. And, and when we do that, fear has no place there. Why would we fear the one who can damage our bodies and not fear the one who holds our souls in his hands? God is for us. Who can be against us? And that there's a stillness in his presence. Even when the enemy is seeking us out, we sit comfortably, worry-free at the table. He doesn't send us through valleys. He leads us through valleys. And lastly, there's no time cap for his kindness and goodness for his people. It's endless. It's endless. When I was younger, I would, I would break out in these panic attacks because I would, I would just randomly think, what if, what if God changes his mind? What if he no longer accounts? What if he no longer holds Jesus' death to, to, to atone for my sin? What, what if he does this? But I, I, I can't defeat God. Like what? I'm, I'm powerless. And I would literally, everything would begin to close in, and I, I would get so scared and so much. I, I would be so afraid that tomorrow he won't be the same God. But here's what I learned over the years. The more I fell into my face, the more I learned about God. That he is immutable, meaning he is unchanging in his character. He's unchanging in his plans. He's unchanging in his will. He can't. He can't do it. Oh, no, Larry, Larry, the God can do anything. He can't. No, he can't. He can't change. He can't do anything outside of his character. What is your confidence that he will remain the same tomorrow? What is your confidence that he will remain with us tomorrow, that he will continue to, to extend grace and kindness to us, that he will remain loving tomorrow? What is your confidence that the same God yesterday today and forevermore says he will. That's your confidence. He's unchanging. There's no time cap. There's no time cap for his kindness and goodness for his people. There's no time cap at all. And because of this, we have confidence to dwell with him forever. We have confidence that he's our shepherd and we shall not want. So again, my fear is that when you leave here today, that you would just, just kind of think the psalm will just serve as a, just a quick pick-me-up. But don't rob yourself and don't rob God's word of its true value. That is much more than that, that it's a declaration. David is making a declaration that God is a shepherd. God is a shepherd to his flock and the host who cares for his cherished guest all the days of their lives. How is this all possible? Again, going back to my opening, if we don't behold the cross, we missed it. We missed it completely. If we don't behold God's ultimate provision for us, why will we trust them in the day to day? How is this possible? Because the great shepherd laid down his life as the unblemished lamb. That's how it's possible led to the slaughter for our sake. For our sake, him who knew no sin would become it. He knew no sin. He didn't know it. He, he knew it intellectually. He knew that he, that's why he had to come, but he didn't know it relationally. He remained perfect, lived a sinless life because eternal life was obedience, and Adam destroyed that 
at the beginning. Jesus came as a greater Adam to perfect that, live the perfect life, perfect obedience, all the way to the cross. And on that cross, he would exchange his perfect, obedient life for our sinful, sinful, disobedient life. And he would go and be crushed as if it was him, as if it was him who owed it. He would die and be raised from the grave three days later, forever leaving that sin, forever triumphant, forever victorious over that sin and death. Now through him, we have eternal life. He's the way, he's the truth, and the life that no one gets to the Father except through him. Making us unblemished. It's the beauty of the gospel, forever moving the stain and ugliness of our sins to dwell in his holy house with a holy God forever. Church, the great shepherd is alive and he's calling his sheep by name. We see in John 10, 3, the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Isn't that just like him? Believers, are you responding to his voice? Are you responding to his voice as you should be? Are, are you allowing him to lead you? Do you trust him? Are you trusting that he will sustain you? Are you comforted by his mercy, by his protection, by his guidance, by his discipline to make you more like him? Or are you running to external things for that? Are you running to external things for the comfort, for the care? In our church and in the world, everywhere we go, there's brokenness. There's broken marriages. There's loss of loved ones. There's depression, anxiety. There's brokenness all around us. We can't afford to run to anything else, to anyone else. And I know you know this. I know you know that everything that you've been running to outside of God has been so empty. It's been so meaningless. We do this because we all naturally long to be comforted. We all naturally long for the care and providence. We all, we all naturally long for that. But the problem is, where are we searching for? Where are we clinging to it? For those of you who are still the wandering sheep, for those of you who have not trusted that our great shepherd, he has compassion for the lost. We see in Mark 6, 34, he says, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them. Why did he have compassion? Because they were like a sheep without a shepherd. They were like a sheep without a shepherd. They were wandering, zero guidance, defenseless, yet very submissive and very compliant to anything that wants to present itself as master. We've all been there. We're all being discipled. We're all being preached to by something. We will follow something. If it's not God, then anything else will do. He has compassion, and this is so big, this is so beautiful, because maybe some of you came in with some burdens that you think are too weighty for Jesus. Maybe you think you come in with just this unforgivable sin that he just cannot forgive you of. It's not true. He has compassion for you. He doesn't roll his eyes at your issues. He doesn't roll his eyes at your problems. He says, come to me with compassion. Will we respond to him today? I close with this quote, you can probably guess, from Spurgeon. He says, in order to say the Lord is my shepherd, he must first fill himself to be a sheep by nature. For he cannot know that God is a shepherd unless he feels in himself that he has the nature of a sheep. 
He must relate to a sheep in its foolishness, its dependency, and it, in its warped nature of its will. Before we can taste the sweetness of the grace of God, we have to truly identify our need for it. And the only way we can do that is if we identify the ugliness of our sin. We're all by nature sheep. We're all by nature wander or defenseless. Not the brightest animal. But there's hope for everyone in the room this morning that he will call you by name. The question is, will you respond? Will you cry out to him today and say, O oh Lord, you are my shepherd. In him I shall not want. Because in you I am complete. Let's pray together. God, I, I pray that we we truly behold what's actually being said to us this morning. God, help us feel the weight of our sin. That we can see the beauty of your son and what he accomplished on the cross for his people. May we respond by falling on our faces and say, God, you are my shepherd and I'm your sheep. I shall not want because you are everything. Lord, would you pierce the hearts of those who do not know you? Would you unveil their eyes of your beauty? That you're the God who sustains, the God who saves, that's fully available for us this morning. Lord, we love and thank you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.